terminal illness and the dying process is unpredictable. You know, right now sitting here, I can't tell you how I'm going to die. Maybe I'm going to be drowning in my scuba diving down in Cozumel. That would be a good way to go very quickly for me. I just did that a month ago and it was so fun, but I didn't die. That's good. Uh, but we don't know. But sometimes life gives us the gift of some choices as we start to go down that uh, end of life pathway. The choices that can either keep us alive longer at all costs, at multiple surgeries, at multiple painful treatments, or choices that may hasten our death, but dramatically reduce the chaos and pain and isolation of hospitalization, surgeries that may be marginal, etc. And my story is about a very courageous woman who had the guts to ask her doctors the questions to understand what her real choices were and make what I think were some very beautiful choices. And that person is, was my mother, Kathleen Wentworth Palmer Quaker. When she was in her late fifties, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was a medical student. I was devastated. I really thought she was going to be dying in four or five years. I didn't really appreciate that fortunately Breast cancer is an indolent, usually five to 20 year process. Uh, she went through the stand, she braved it through and did the standard treatment, had a modified radical mastectomy, her whole breast removed, the dissection of her axilla armpit. She had radiation to her chest wall. She had pretty toxic chemotherapy that made her quite sick, nauseated, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue for weeks. And she lost a lot of her hair. And for my mom, her signature beauty was her scalp hair. And this was really pretty devastating for her, but she bucked up and she did all that stuff because the doctor said, that's what you gotta do. That's how, you know, we've had really good results with this and we're gonna fight this thing to the end and we're gonna get you through it. Uh, and I was still a medical student and didn't know better. Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily criticize that first group of treatments. Those are pretty standard and they probably do result in longer lifespans. Um, and she, like most women, fortunately, she had four or five years with absolutely no symptoms, lived, lived her life very normally. Some blood tests showed that she did have a recurrence after about four or five years. And so her doctor said, well, yeah, we must have missed some of it. Some of it must have gone into, the, in, into other parts of the body and metastasized. So, but we've got this treatment, adriamycin, and it was a whole cocktail of things, and we can give it to you. And we've had some pretty good results with some people. The little word there is some people. It's kind of like up to 50% off when you go to a sale and you go in the store and almost everything's full price. Um, well, I did a little research at that point and found out that not only was this cocktail not going to cure her, but it was probably going to only, on average, add just a few months to her life. And it was almost certainly going to make her bald or at least lose 90 or more percent of her hair and make her very sick for weeks, if not months. Now, so I'm gonna pause for a second and let you guys think you've got a diagnosis of a cancer, you've been okay for four or five years, now they say it's coming back and the doctors give you optimistic reports that they can really fight this with you. All you need to do is go through this little treatment. And yes, there's a few side effects. And if you ask the question, then you learn the side effects that I just mentioned. Are you gonna push the button? Yes, go for it. Or are you gonna decline? And I'll just wait five or 10 seconds, just, just to think about it. You might wanna jot down yes or decline, just to kind of think about where you're at at this point in your life. Um, so now that I gave you a little diversion as to decide whether you're gonna go for the adriamycin or not. Well, my mom talked to her doctors and found out all this information. She did not wanna lose her hair. She did not wanna have all this treatment. And the quality of her life for the remainder of her life was more important than the quantity. So she declined that uh, second tier of chemotherapy. And fortunately, she did well for another four or five years, which is very common. You can see demonstrations of micro metastases and they don't necessarily make you sick right away. Again, more time needs to go by, but breast cancer and most cancers keep going. And so it, about five years later, after dancing up a storm and doing all kinds of things, she noticed pain in her right thigh and she got an x-rayed and there was a pathologic fracture in the middle of her femur bone. 
What that means is the cancer was in the middle of her femur bone and it was eating away the bone, taking out the calcium and making a, a, like a moth-eaten spice there. It literally looks like the moth has gone in and eaten away at the bone. And she was advised that it was very weak and uh, even just walking on it, very likely within a short time, it was gonna break in two. And so the next decision she had to make is, do I have surgery? Well, she was basically in pretty good health at that point. It was a pretty big surgery. I was in Mexico. I, we got to delay the surgery for three days so I could fly back from Mexico to be with her. You know, I wasn't sure she was going to, you know, get through the surgery. Uh, so, but she did. She recovered and she was uh, back into reasonably good health. And we were thinking, okay, we dodged another bullet. But we knew there was cancer in the bone. So now we're starting to see things have progressed. Okay, then. Out of the blue, about three months after the surgery, she started losing her appetite and getting sleepy, and she went into a coma. She was not, we got her to the hospital, they did tests, and totally separate from her cancer disease, she had acute renal failure from the blockage of the little ureter tubes that come from the kidneys down to the bladder. And if, if you can't get the pee from the kidneys into the bladder, the kidneys do not work, and you go into renal failure. Well, the doctors were able to thread a little tube up and open up the kidneys. And like six hours later, my, my, my mom woke up in the hospital and said, why am I in the hospital? And it was wonderful. It looked like this, but it, I mean, it was a temporary cure, but her doctor said with this kind of scarring of those tubes, it's gonna recur. The only way around that is to do a big surgery in her back and open up the kidney tubes into a, a collecting tube, you know, into a collecting bag. And she's gonna have to be emptying this pee out of her, you know, bag every few hours. And it's a surgery and definitely chances of getting infections and complications from the surgery. The more important thing for my mom was, yes, it could buy you more time, but we're seeing her going down this road of uh, bone fractures uh, with the metastases. Uh, and we know that uh, breast cancer goes to the liver. It goes to the brain. When it goes to the brain, you can lose function of an arm. You can lose your sight. You can lose your uh, uh, being able to talk. You can get severe unrelenting headaches. So if we cure her kidney problem by doing the surgery, she's going to have a bigger problem down the road. So here's the dilemma my mom had. She accepts the surgery. And she cures herself of this obstruction because they bypass it. And she's not going to die from chemo, uh, renal failure. But she's going to die from her cancer. And it's a matter of months or maybe a year or two. And it's going to be a bad downhill course with all the complications associated with breast cancer. Uh, or she cannot accept the surgery. And sometime in the future, unknown time, her kidneys are going to clamp down, her ureters are going to clamp down and she's gonna go back into a quiet coma and within a few days, she's gonna peacefully die. So I'm gonna give you a second here. Now you're 10 years from your cancer diagnosis. You've had 10 great years kind of knowing that this cancer's coming and actually probably worrying about how is it gonna be when it really gets bad? How much pain medicine I'm gonna to need to handle the pain from the cancer? Am I gonna lose my sight along the way with metastases to my brain? Um, but she's dodged that bullet for 10 years, but now the moment of truth is coming of whether she wants to continue on that pathway or use this other pathway to a quieter death. Okay, I'm at 10 minutes. I think I'm a little more than halfway done, Janet. Thank you. Uh, well, so what would you guys do? Are you going for the surgery to have a hole in your back and a little tube coming out into a bag and probably have pretty good health for a while? Or is it time to say enough is enough? Well, I'll mention one other thing that happened while my mom was thinking about this. She, she really grilled her doctors about what she could expect. She's in a chair and she pushes herself out of the chair and she breaks her clavicle, her little collarbone. Why did she break her collar, clavicle? Because there was metastases in the middle of the clavicle eating away at the bone. So now we know that she's got metastases, not just in that one femur, but in a totally separate part of the body way up here. And most likely it's in a lot of other bones as well. She was having some back pain. Maybe that's just back pain. Maybe that's because the metastases are in her, in her vertebrae. Okay, 
Time's up. Hopefully you all made your decision. My mom, as you might expect, said enough is enough. I'd rather be at home with my family whatever time I have left. I don't want to be going back and forth. I don't want to have the surgery and recover from it. I don't want to deal with this bag of pee on my, my side. I don't want to have more fractures and go to the ER and have more orthopedic surgeries. I don't want radiation to these bone areas, which often leave you pretty debilitated. And so she refused the, the uh, renal, uh, the kidney uh, surgery. Okay. Um, we were, my, my little family and my mom were living in Phoenix at that point. She had her separate home, but we moved her into our home so we could be together because we knew we didn't have a lot of time. And uh, it was some of the best time I've had with her since I was a kid because I wasn't a kid for a long time. I was, by that point, you know, I had my own family. I had a little three-year-old daughter who loved her grandmother. None of us wanted my mother to die, but we wanted to spend the time we could with her. And so she moved in. Uh, we had a lot of good meals together over the next several months. And then she started losing her appetite, not a good sign. She started getting sleepier, not a good sign. We got the blood test. Uh, her oncologist confirmed, well, I, I looked at the blood test too. She had definitely elevated renal function tests, which means the kidneys are not clearing themselves. And she had this sky high calcium. As a young doctor, I'd never seen a calcium that high. I have to admit, I freaked out. I thought, I'm a doctor, we should treat this. This is an emergency. You know, this can cause tetany and cramps. So I call up her oncologist and he's an older, much wiser guy and he says, huh, this is part of the process. The reason her calcium is so high is because the, the metastases are eating her bones and it's just dissolving all that calcium into her blood and her kidneys can't clear it. And so her calcium is probably gonna go higher before this is over. But remember, that's what your mom wanted. She wanted to go the renal failure route and that's really kind of part of it, particularly when you have metastases eating away at your bones. So I was able to kind of calm down and stop being a doctor and being a son again, supporting my mom. And uh, he gave me a bottle of morphine and I had the syringes and I could give my mom small doses of morphine to help her with her bone pain. She was pretty comfortable. She was getting sleepier and she, then she totally lost her appetite and wasn't thirsty anymore. You know, you're not peeing, so you don't get very thirsty when you don't pee. Uh, and then another three days go by and she goes into a light coma and uh, we're kind of arousing her and saying, are you okay, mom? Are you okay? And then she you know, oh, kind of hurts. So we give her a little morphine and then three more days and she's in a deep coma and her pulse is getting really rapid, 120, her blood pressure's on the floor, her breathing is labored. And so I called my, my wife who really loved my mom a lot. Uh, my mom was really good to my wife and our little three-year-old. And we told her how much we loved her. She was in her bed and we sat beside her and held her hand. She was in a coma, realistically. She probably didn't hear a word we said, but it helped us because we were there with her. She wasn't off in some hospital, you know. Uh, and uh, we said goodbye that night. And the next morning we found her very still and quiet in the bed, no longer breathing. You know, she had died very quietly during the night. So that is the 10 year sequence of what I think was the most beautiful dying process that I have been privileged to witness. And I'm so grateful as my mom. Just a few other closing words. Where are we at, Janet? Not about close to the five minute. Five minutes, okay, I can do this. Uh, we, uh, we knew that her decision would almost certainly mean that she was gonna die quicker. And that's kind of part of why she did that decision because she didn't wanna live that extra year in a lot of pain and debility in a, in a nursing home where she you know, had to have somebody help her on the, the porta potty next to her bed because she broke her leg and couldn't walk. Uh, and, but it, it took, these, these were not obvious decisions. And in this general thing, if you don't talk to your doctors, they will tell you what treatment options you have in as positive a way and optimistic way as they can. If you don't ask them, what are the complications? 
And how much more time is this going to give me, doctor? And what quality of life is this going to give me? They're generally not going to volunteer that information because a lot of patients don't want that. Doctors have found that out. It's not just all the doctor's fault. It's our fault because we don't ask the difficult questions. But if you do ask the difficult questions like my mom did, and I contributed to some of those questions for my mom, I said, mom, be sure you ask them this question and this question because I, I'm really concerned about this. Most doctors will be honest with you if, you're, if you ask the pointed questions. And my mom had the courage to do that and she got the answers and then she had the courage to act on that information. And it would have been perfectly fine for her to say, no, I'm going for the last day that I can get out of this life and I don't care how much it hurts. And I know that you can give me morphine and I'll be okay. And that's what a lot of people do. And that's perfectly fine as long as it's an informed consent, at least from my point of view. So uh, I'm very proud of my mom and I'm very proud that I could be part of all that and maybe contribute a little bit. It often is a family decision because it's agonizingly hard for that individual person to make that decision without support. So hopefully we can be supportive of our loved ones uh, when whatever decision they make. And I hope that this kind of inspires you to ask those difficult questions. If by any chance you get a disease where you have some choices, uh, unless you drown scuba diving in Cozumel, you know, that's about a three minute death. Like, oh, oh, I've got three more minutes, but so I, I'll finish up before that. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Janet, you're doing a great job for us. Uh, you know, unless you're lucky that way or you get hit by the Mack truck, you know, most of us are going to die from prolonged, debilitating, chronic illness. And we have now, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention is now, fortunately, we didn't have it when my mom was doing this, uh, which was many years ago. We now, in California, and I think in other 11 states and District of Columbia, we have end-of-life option acts. I know you guys know about that, where if things get really bad or look like they're going to get bad, we can apply to get a prescription medication and we, sol we swallow that medication and in 10 to 30 minutes, we, have, we die. And we don't have to prolong things to the very end. So uh, I'm not wishing that on anyone. I hope we don't have to make those tough decisions. Uh, it's nice to think we're gonna have an easy death, but um, many times it will be a very difficult death if we just depend on the optimism of the doctor to keep treating us. So I wanna thank you for your patience and time, and I hope this is helpful in your journey. That is a super excellent question. I have been retired a long time, and actually the last part of my career, I was a clinic doctor. I didn't do a lot of hospital medicine, but I, I've kept up a little bit because I'm interested. You know, it's changed a lot because now the, uh, most reimbursement through Medicare, which is what most of us have as old fogies, is uh, on basis of diagnosis and the hospitals are given a certain amount of money to care for you if you come in with that uh, diagnosis. And so the name of the game economically is get you out as quickly as possible, treat you, get you in the hospital, treat you, and then get you out as quickly as possible. So it, in terms of prolonging hospitalizations, the pressure is to get you out. And unfortunately, a lot of times, if you haven't made good plans to, to uh, live in place in your home, you're going to go to a nursing home. And you, know, you may get good care there, but you're going to be in the nursing home environment as opposed to your own home environment. So it's going to be very hard to die at home if you're in a nursing home. <laughs> yeah, that kind of goes without saying. Uh, I think I... You'd like to think that doctors totally uh, respond to just the best interest of the patient, but you know, the best interest of the patient is really complicated. And some people want the full court press and some of us like myself don't want the full court press. We want the almost no court press, you know, when we get to that point. Uh, and so, uh, but certainly surgeons get reimbursed for doing surgeries. That's something, if they don't do surgery, they don't get paid. If they do a surgery, they get paid. Oncologists not only get paid for treating you, but most oncology drugs are done in, your, in the office. And oncologists are one of the few groups of doctors that are allowed to charge their patients for medicine with a substantial markup. So they get medicines that are pretty expensive and they double the price of that medicine and it gets really expensive, but who cares because insurance is paying for it. And so oncologists make a lot of money by having patients that agree with them to take the treatments. 
So those are the those are the conflicts of interest that I'm kind of aware of. Uh, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't take any you know chemotherapy. It just means you should ask really hard questions about the efficacy of that chemotherapy uh, and full disclosure about side effects. We doctors are so bad about minimizing side effects of medicines for people, and I found myself that way too. Well, yeah, I might give you a little sickness for a day or two, and then you know a week later the person still vomiting up their guts from their chemotherapy, you know. So enough of my soapbox on that one. Uh, you, we didn't. And I think it was our own ignorance. Hospice was a, my mom died in the 80s and hospice was just really kind of beginning in that time. The whole concept that, you know, you might want to stop treatments and die at home was, we, we'd gone through this revolution. So I, all I can speak for is my own ignorance that I think both my mom and I were not aware of it. We basically kind of did hospice care because it was in the home. She had stopped aggressive treatments. Her oncologist gave me the morphine because I was a physician, I could give her the morphine. She didn't want IVs and stuff because she, you know, when she went into renal failure, she wanted it to be over. She wasn't trying to, to uh, you know, live a couple more days with extra fluids. When, when, she, when she stopped feeling the urge to drink, she stopped drinking, you know. So we kind of did our own modified hospice, uh, but the answer was, I just didn't know enough to be, I really believe in hospice now, but I didn't know much about it then. I've heard that, and I think uh, Robin can speak to that too. Uh, Robin, right? Yeah, that was an issue with, with your doctors, and you can talk about it in your presentation. I'm sure you're going to. Uh, yeah, I think because when the doctor does that, they're afraid the patient can say, "Are you giving up on me? You mean you don't want me as a patient anymore? You don't want to treat me?" No, I'm trying to give you options, but it can. I, I've I've actually tried to work with some people not as their doctor. And it's amazing the amount of uh, death denial people have. I had a family quickly that had terrible, okay, uh, yeah, time's up. So we'll talk more at this session. I, I don't want to go, go into it because uh, Robin's got great information for you. First, what I want to say is um, uh, this topic uh, is, is very emotionally fraught for me. And I've realized that the only way that I can uh, coherently convey to you what I wanna to communicate today is to read it. And so I wanna apologize in advance for the lack of eye contact, but we'll make up for that later. My husband, Bill, had had a neurodegenerative condition similar to multiple sclerosis for about eight years. He was 78 years old and had been housebound for the past three years after he had suddenly lost the ability to walk unassisted and could no longer drive. However, until the day he entered hospice care, he was still able to get around with a rolling walker and could even navigate the stairs in our two-story house. One day last fall, while walking down the hall with his rollator, he had a stroke that immediately eradicated his ability to walk or stand, even with assistance. His mental function was also affected somewhat, although he could still speak clearly. Bill had made it abundantly clear that he wanted to die at home when the time came and that he never wanted to see the inside of a hospital ever again, no matter what happened. These wishes were reflected in his recently updated Advanced Healthcare Directive. Since there is no bedroom on the ground floor of our house, it was clear that I had to get him into hospice that day. Otherwise, he'd be lying on the floor all night. I can tell you, at least in my experience, it takes extraordinary determination to avoid the medicalized system for death that is prevalent in our culture. You need to have a plan, know what your plan is in advance. You have to be very clear and emphatic about what you need insist on it and don't take no for an answer. If you're dealing with a sudden event like we were, you can expect that everyone you talk to will tell you you must hang up, call 911 and get the patient to the emergency room. You can say no. 
This is your show. It is not their show. Uh, let me splice in uh, to the question raised about uh, do doctors not, uh, you know, sort of advocate against hospice. Uh, what I encountered was plain out ignorance. It stuns me, but my husband's primary care physician, this is the primary care physician for a 78 year old man in poor health, had no idea that he, the doctor, could directly refer or approve hospice for my husband. Um, at any rate, for me, the bottom line, my mantra that day was, look, I need a hospital bed, a bedpan, a urinal and a hospice nurse in my home by bedtime tonight. I got it done, but I had to be a bulldog. I wanna talk for a minute about what hospice is and what hospice is not. The goal of hospice is to keep the patient comfortable and out of the hospital. So they are the perfect partner for a home death. Hospice provides support, but it is not the primary source of care. They only make routine home visits once a week for about an hour until very close to the end of life. So family caregivers are the backbone of the hospice model of care. And in fact, it's my opinion that the free labor that we provide is what makes this mode of care viable. So you think of it this way. Hospice is there for you, but they're not there with you. And here's the impact of that. There are lots of truly unpleasant things that happen with very sick and dying patients. In a hospital setting, the nursing staff is there to take care of these things, which generally happens outside of visiting hours. So most of us are oblivious to all of that. But when the patient is at home, these unpleasant things happen right there in your living room. Hospice does provide 24 seven telephone support and they will send a nurse to your home at any hour. And it doesn't have to be an out and out emergency. I called them sometime for help with uh, adjusting medications, but there will be a time lag. And in the meantime, you're left on your own. I can tell you, I really tested that 24 seven support system. Bill's death process was blessedly brief, but very intense. Over just a six day period, I had to call hospice four times during the middle of the night, resulting in two emergency night nurse visits and two middle of the night pharmacy deliveries. And by the way, who knew that that was a thing? Middle of the night pharmacy deliveries. Uh, I, I do want to share today some specific details of my experience, um, some of which are disturbing. But if you're contemplating supporting a loved one's home death or asking someone to support your own home death, I believe you should be aware of the full range of possible experiences. So based on my experience, here are some of the situations that may arise. The patient may disavow their carefully expressed end of life intentions. Midday on the day after his stroke, Bill asked, what's for breakfast? I reminded him that he had decided that if he reached the point where he was, the point where he was completely non-ambulatory, uh, that he would implement a process called voluntary stopping eating and drinking or VSED, which Anita, our next speaker, will discuss more about. He looked me in the eye and said, that's crap, where's breakfast? So fortunately that issue resolved itself by the next day when he no longer asked about food or drink, but just be aware that even the best laid plans can suddenly fly out the window. The patient may not respond well to the comfort medications provided by hospice. Uh, for example, the initially prescribed sleeping aid made Bill more anxious and actually a bit delusional. Uh, dosages of anti-anxiety medications that were supposed to last three or four hours lasted about one hour for Bill. And also because his condition was changing so rapidly, it required constant adjustments to the medication protocol. This made it difficult to keep up with. And I felt like we were always just chasing symptoms. The patient may not remember what their condition is. 
Bill became agitated and attempted to get out of bed every night up until the day before his death, despite heavy sedation. He didn't remember that his legs would no longer support him. One episode was so bad, I had to sit on his legs on the bed for two and a half hours waiting for the night nurse to arrive. I can't even begin to express how utterly miserable that was. The patient can become deranged and aggressive and may say some very hurtful things. The night that I had to sit on his legs, Bill thrashed and cursed and called me every name in the book, which took a severe emotional toll on me. But honestly, even without crises like this, there's the physical and emotional strain of just the everyday tasks of having a patient at home, such as changing your loved one's diapers and changing the bed linens. And both of these things have to be done with the patient in the bed. This becomes especially hard on your back once the patient is heavily sedated and inert. The bottom line is you cannot know in advance what kind of experience you will have or when it will end. Bill's end of life stage approached more quickly than expected. Two nights after the episode of sitting on his legs, I woke up at 1.20 a.m. to the sounds of his death rattle breathing. I had never heard a death rattle, but there was absolutely no doubt in my mind what I was hearing. I knew that the death rattle is just a sound that occurs during breathing when a dying person can no longer clear liquid from the back of the throat. It's commonly referred to as secretions. I was also aware that the patient is not in distress during the, the uh, uh, death rattle, although the sound is, is disturbing for others to hear. For that reason, the hospice kit includes a medication to decrease the secretions and minimize the death rattle, but in Bill's case, it did nothing. Over several hours, the sound got more intense, it sounded like boiling water. Then a thick, foamy, brownish substance began to flow out of his nose and mouth. This was far more than anything you could term secretions, and it did not stop. That's when I freaked out, and I once again called for an emergency nurse visit. When she arrived, and thankfully it was much sooner than two and a half hours, I asked if she had ever seen this before, and she said, yes, it happens sometime, but she said she's starting to see it more often, and no one seems to know why. I do wanna emphasize that although this was gross and horrendously traumatizing to me, it was very clear that Bill was not consciously experiencing this and he wasn't suffering or in any pain. His body was simply going through the process of shutting down. Summarizing a very long and traumatic day, by that evening, Bill was comfortable and sedated I had arranged full round the clock home health aid coverage, and I was looking forward to my first full night's sleep in almost a week. However, it was not to be, because I had forgotten that home health aides cannot administer any medications. So after having been up for 22 hours straight, I had to get up every two hours during the night to give Bill his medications. Around nine o'clock the next morning, I was in my home office emailing updates to family on Bill's condition. The home health aide gently knocked on the door to tell me that Bill's breathing had suddenly changed. I went to his side, I held his hand and spoke to him, said my final words. He drew his last breath about five minutes later. After all that we had been through, it was quite peaceful and calm at the very, very end. And I found peace in the knowledge that he was finally free of his misery and got his wish to die at home. Home death is indeed not for the faint of heart. At the end, I was mentally and physically exhausted and had experienced emotional trauma that took me quite some time to process after his death. So why in the world 
would anyone want to take this on? Well, death is a part of life. This is vital and loving and important work. It's a sacred trust. And even though my experience was hellish, it was also profound and meaningful. Afterwards, honestly, I felt like I hadn't fully lived until I had had this privilege of shepherding a loved one through death's door. And to me, that's the answer. Thank you for this opportunity to share my story. Uh, neither Bill nor I have any family within thousands of miles. <laughs> uh, I have friends. They ran errands. They brought food. Um, for one thing, this was so sudden. And, uh, you know, wouldn't you know, I had seen some decline in Bill. And would you believe I had set up an appointment? Now, remember, this all happened in the midst of the pandemic. So it was mm. tough to get doctor appointments anyway. Um, and I had set up a palliative care doctor's appointment, I wanted to shift him to somebody who focused on palliative care. And I had my list of questions, you know, I was trying to grease the skids to be prepared for when we entered hospice so I could just, you know, one call and get it done. Would you believe that appointment was set for what turned out to be the day before Bill died? Um, so we, you know, the suddenness of it and how fast things were moving um, kind of, uh, just it made it un, not feasible for me to, you know, I, I was kept chasing this situation, as you said, but absolutely, I 100% I say, uh, it, you do need a team. And if you can have things lined up and uh, one thing is um, to qualify for hospice, a physician has to certify that it is likely that you will die within six months. But until the day Bill needed hospice, nobody would have said that of him. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can get hospice on board as soon as possible and just get it started and start finding out what you're going to need and get your team in place, it will be a much uh, easier task, even if all of these strange things happen in your home. Uh, no, by that point, I did. Well, OK, I don't know that I knew that they only came once a week for an hour. Um, I did know that it's not like there, you know, hospice means there is medical staff always in your home. I, I did know that. Okay. But the degree of what I knew is uh, hard to capture at this point. But no, it's not like I thought I was, oh, you know, oh, I can just go about my business. Hospice is in charge. No, I didn't think that. For me, it would not, gratefully, it would not have been a, a financial hardship. It was, you know, I kept, I've done a lot of thinking about this. <laughs> uh, it was like, what could I have done or could I have done something differently? Um, I kept getting lulled into, okay, now we got the medications uh, right, it will be fine. And then there'd be this crisis. Now we've got this straightened out. I mean, I, I Things just kept happening so fast. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd have like, I don't know, 12 hours of, yeah, I can handle this with hospice's support and food coming in. And then bang, if it had gone on one more day. Oh, uh, let me say that one thing I would have changed. If Bill had not died the morning he, he died, I would have had a nurse on staff that night for the nighttime mm -hmm. cycle because there's no way I would have gone another night having to get up to, to um, give medications. And that's the one tip I would give anybody who's going to do hospice with home health. Get somebody to cover, uh, cover the night shift who can um, uh, give medications to a patient.
It is daunting. Now, uh, hospice gives you a binder um, that has a lot of information that, frankly, I didn't have time to read, but it has um, a medication log. And uh, that was the one thing I may, remained very faithful about. It was filling that in because that I did have to rely on that because there are so many medications. And again, because Bill's condition was changing so rapidly, the dosages and the medications were constantly changing. Um, and so that's how I kept track of that. Um, okay. But yeah, it's a chore. And, and particularly when you're tired, and let's face it, a lot of us go into the hospice, hospice phase already somewhat depleted from years of caregiving. And yeah, just keeping all of this straight in your head uh, is a challenge for sure. Yeah. But no, it hasn't, no. Um, no, I don't at all. No. I need to make a qualification. We did not implement VSED. It is true, that, and, and hospice was very correct on this. They told me at the, at the beginning when I mentioned this, ah, we were going to do VSED, but he wants food. And I did feed him a little bit that day. Um, the hospice manager had told me, she's like, you're very unlikely in this case to need to implement VSED. He is likely to just die on his own. And she was very correct. Um, so, I mean, near death, people don't eat. Naturally, they don't eat. Implementing voluntary stopping eating and drinking um, is a different thing, but no, I, that didn't have anything to do with the okay. secretions. Thank you, Barry. And, um, Thank you, Robin, for your very moving story. As Robin and I have spoken earlier, I have many stories like Robin's because people aren't quite as prepared as they can be or want to be because they don't realize how quickly things move. So there are people such as myself out there where we can be resourced. Oh, so anyway, today I am speaking about Be Said. Um, while helping a loved one die at home. And as we all know, VSED is voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. And um, we, it's legal to everyone here in the United States and it's allowed in every state. Here's the kicker. What's considered your home, which is what comes into play in my client's situation. B said usually goes best with assistance from someone like myself, a medical team and or hospice and or both. Let me introduce John Doe, my client. Uh, we didn't have anyone from uh, the Hemlock Society who had anyone uh, who had a family member die with B said so um, we're using my client as an example. John was 93 years old, fully cognizant man, but riddled with severe arthritis. He and his wife, who was in end-stage dementia, lived with their son and their daughter-in-law in a freestanding uh, independent home like most people live. John fell and he broke one of his legs. The possibility of ever walking again, even with intense reha rehab, was very low. This comes into play with what, what uh, Hunt was saying about percentages and listening to your doctors. Remember, he was 93. He was nearly crippled with his severe arthritis. And even if they could fix his leg um, and he was already in very severe pain, his chances of walking again were 2%. He made his own decision along with that of his family 
meaning his son and his daughter, to simply lie in bed the rest of his life, never to walk again, versus going through rehab due to the pain, due to his arthritic condition. So his family moved him into a facility. Well, at the facility, he complained. <laughs> and due to his complaining, the, the facility threw him out. And many of you may not know this, but this happens a lot. If you complain a lot, the facility can ask you to leave, and they do. So the family was then searching for a place for John to live. So they found a, a board and care, which are usually small places of the six to eight people. And that's where he went to live in October. Being there by December, he had decided that he no longer wanted medications, meaning those that would in any way contribute to keeping his health in um, him alive in, 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 in any, any way, such as his high cholesterol medications or anything like that. He was gonna stop all those types of medications. By January, he then made his decision to stop eating, thinking that if he stopped eating, he would certainly die soon. However, he kept drinking. John called his children, his son and his daughter, and he had a family discussion about his intentions. Remember, he's very cognizant throughout this whole process. Well, obviously the facility found out about John's intentions and, and what he was doing because the board and care is regulated to feed him, you know, three times a day or offer him food and he has given it up. So the board and care called in a hospice and they called the children. <laughs> the hospice they called did not support B said. The children stood by their father's decision. However, they were kind of all at odds at this point, obviously. So the board and care didn't really believe that the children and, and John had the right to make that choice either. They thought that morally and ethically he was in the wrong. So um, the children found a different hospice where who believed in B said. B said uh, that hospice also recommended another doctor who believed in B said as well as MAID to see if John qualified for MAID. So the, the new hospice, the, the separate independent doctor and the, the facility and John and his children got together and had a meeting and tried to decide um, what legal, moral, ethical issues and how they could work around this. It was found out that the physician did not think that John qualified for MAID here with this limited scope in California. So this is where I finally enter the story. <laughs> I became the case manager as well as John's doula, interfacing between the family, the board and care, the hospice, and honoring John's wishes. I sat alongside, beside ships with the children, offering John assistance. I was trying to keep the board and care people away from John as much as possible in a respectful way because they felt of their legal obligations to serve him and to honor what they thought were his mor or their moral obligations to do whatever he requested, even if he was in delirium and asking for water, they would want to give him gulps of water. And so um, 
you know, we were a little bit at odds, so we had to be a bit diplomatic on all these fronts. So John needed to have his mouth swabbed whenever he asked for water versus the gulps of water, which would further his days. Because John wasn't in an independent home, I tried to keep John from asking for fluids when the board and pair of care people came into his room. I would touch him, I would reassure him and remind him of his resolve. However, even that was difficult um, because of things I'll mention. Most of what I could do for John was simple comfort care, to be honest. I kept his lips moist as much as possible with things like lip balm. If he asked for water, I would swab his mouth to help keep it gently moist. John was nearly deaf, so I have to lean in right up next to his ear and speak directly into his ear, hoping his spirit and his soul and maybe his hearing picked up any messages I was sending to him. I'd also read to him in this exact same manner. Because of John's condition, the one place I could touch him without any obvious pain was his head and his face because of the extreme pain everywhere else on his body. So, Human touch, as probably many of you know, is vital to let the dying know that they're not alone. And yet too much touch can distress and disturb the gentle passing of the spirit when it's time to go. So I had to use a lot of breathing techniques, Reiki, nurturing touch for the dying techniques, which I had studied to help keep John calm. If John was in pain, I actually demanded as his advocate that the board and care people give John his medication, which was morphine at that point. At times, the board and care people resisted me as they felt that I was offering John medication to hasten his own death. Whereas I'm trained to watch for signs of suffering like facial expressions, grimacing, so on, and uh, clenching of the fist, things like that. So I would call hospice directly, or I would call the medical doctor who was also on board, and I would have them call the board and care and make them give John his medication, or I would simply have them come out and give the medication themselves. I always had to advocate for my client. From the time when John decided to no longer have active medical care until the night he died was nine months, totally bedridden. From the time when we got everyone on board to enforce John's wishes to stop drinking even when he asked during delirium, was 13 days. John's last words were that he wanted a hot dog. His, doc, his daughter, she just told me this last week, his daughter told me that she so regretted that she couldn't honor this wish of giving him everything he wanted up to the very end and then simply to have him have his medication as in made for medical aid in dying and let him go that way. Unfortunately, that's not, that wasn't allowed in John's case. B said was John's only option. He chose it willingly and he chose it openly, but there were numerous hurdles which you should be aware of if planning this path. Get yourself in the right situation. Get the right resources lined up. Know and understand that the first week can be tough, but also know with the right resources that the very end is peaceful 
and it's quiet and it's without struggle. Thirst is the only real challenge that John had with uh, said due to how long it takes. The need for, flu for food dissipated quite quickly as John had already given up eating anyway. The thing to remember is that B said for John wasn't all that traumatic. It was the circumstances surrounding where he lived and the people who saw that John wanting to do what he wanted to do was what made it so. As a postscript, I just wanted to tell you that one year later, the children called me and they told me that John's wife died from end-stage dementia and the family decided that they would not let her enter a facility after having all of the things happen that had happened to their father. Thank you. I, I had relief. Um, it was something I organized with children. We, we set up schedules on shifts on who was going to stay with John when. So no, I was not there all day. I have other clients I look after, so that would not have been possible, number one. And how did I get involved in this situation? I'm, I get referrals a lot of times from a lot of different uh, people in the community, and I was referred by the medical doctor who was uh, called in. Okay. It could have been, Hunt. It might have been easier in the long run, although, as Robin pointed out in her in her talk, um, John had to be changed and his linens had to be changed and all of these things. And so uh, because of his brittle bones and being in so much pain, mm -hmm. the family was a little bit afraid to take that on. And even with the care of hospice, Hospice is only there one hour a day if they're there and, and usually during that time, one hour a week, unless it's needed towards the end, they come more often. And um, so they were a, a bit afraid to take that on. And so they chose to work within the system where they were already uh, situated, although it was a bit complicated. Thank you. I hope that answers that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know because um, I, I, I wasn't involved that early in the process. I do think that this is a good time to bring it up since we're talking about death at home and, and hospices and board and cares and, and things like that, because a lot of my clients do live in a facility, is that every facility and board and care and, and hospice has their own rules and regulations. Some hospices will assist with MAID, some hospices will assist with BSED, other hospices will say absolutely no, under no circumstances. And um, same, with, same with all sorts of facilities from, from board and cares to um, you know, a facility just where a, a long-term care facility or a facility where it's an assisted living, whatever. Some, some facilities people are totally comfortable with that and other facilities say, we don't want to have anything to do with that. It's something that you need to look into and or find out about um, 
there's a facility down in the South Bay area where I had a client who was checking out VSED at one point. And even though she and her spouse lived in an independent home, they chose not to let anyone know once they, ch they chose not to use VSED and ended up going with the maid. They chose not to let anyone in the entire complex know that they were doing any of that because they found out legally she would have to leave her home and go into the um, like the nursing area. And of course, the whole point is to be at home. I've always been a death doula all my life. I, I went to college to be in the health services industry and I have been around death since the age of three when my auntie died in childbirth and it, and, uh, it, it goes from there. I have a long uh, passionate history of, of it. And I don't know that everyone wants to hear my story now, but I'd be happy to talk about it sometime. And um, I think most of all, it's, uh, the, it, it's about helping the person who is dying as much as helping the family because there's so many unexpected twists and turns and you have to know where the resources are and what is available in our communities and what is out there so that you can direct them so that they can make their own choices more than it is about um, a, a lot of other things. And so you have to um, really understand where, where, where they can get the right resources so that they can make their own choices. At the end, I would love to also be in my own home, of course. And uh, I would love to do a presentation sometime with all of you where we, we would do a presentation and figure out, help, help each of you figure out what, what it is that you want. But um, that's, that's a whole different presentation. Can A lot of people think that um, you have to get permission from your primary care doctor in order to go to hospice. And you do not have to do that. If your primary care physician is not willing to go there and have that discussion, which happens more times than I even can tell you from my experience with my clients, then many, many, many times I just pull the go around for an ad, as an advocate for my clients is just simply go to whatever hospice we interview. We, I usually recommend interviewing at least three hospices at a minimum, and then go to them and they all have medical staff on board and having their medical doctor do the um, assessment if they qualify or not. And I've had, I've had hospices who say, no, you don't qualify. They will not qualify you if you don't qualify. So that, that may be the one tip you can take away today that you do not have to wait for your primary care physician. You can actually have the hospice help you with that. 